as long as I can remember. I don't know if I like it or if I'm just used to it. But I do know this. Being lonely does things to you. Feeling shit and bitter and angry all the time just eats away at you. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever played a game that has affected you in some way? Left you scarred or emotionally changed in some way? Like you can easily relate to that game? Obviously that's over exaggerated, but I think you might know what I mean. I mean, it's very rare for this feeling to happen to us in games, but I like to discuss that and how it left me in a strange way with this game. Dating people, my name is Thomas, and welcome to Game Talk, where I chat about games and you have a chat about it in the comments. And today, we cover. Now, before we begin this review, I will say that I will be delving into dark subjects into this video, so it might leave you a bit affected or scarred by this. Also, I will not be able to, you know, cover every single thing in this game because this game has just so much, you know, lore to it and so much, you know, messages behind the wall that I will not be able to do myself. So keep this in mind whilst you watch the video. But anyhow, let's get right into it. Cry of Fear is a horror psychological game developed by Team Psychala and designed by Andreas Vonberg, both Swedish names that I apologise for if I pronounce them wrong. They are also known for Afraid of Monsters, a Half-Life 1 con horror conversion mod, both of which ran on the Gold Source engine, which is used for a lot of old Valve games. Originally, Cry of Fear was going to be another conversion mod that was released on February 22, 2012. But, because it got so much attention, the developers made it a standalone game, whilst also pushing the engine to its limits in terms of design and animation. Ever since its full release on April 25th, 2013, Cry of Fear has become a classic horror game, receiving huge positive scores such as 9 out of 10 on Steam and 9.4 out of 10 on ModDB. However, since 2014, further updates for the game has stopped as Team Psychala want to move on, which is understandable and I can't wait to see what they come up with next. I think it's only appropriate to start off with the story of the game. You play as 19 year old Simon Henriksen, who doesn't look too happy as we see him on the train, as well as his monologue in the intro. All of a sudden we see an injured man on the floor begging for help. But as Simon tries to help him, then this sequence plays out, which I have no clue about. It does make a good trip, though. Now we arrive in what I can say is Simon's room, except with a pitch black corridor. Nice. As we can see, there are X's around the room, and we can use the camera to unlock them as they reveal doors, writing on the walls, scary people. And this! To me, personally, that is a perfect way to set up a game and put the player in an unknown environment so they don't know what to expect. And trust me, I should know this. Come on. <coughs> we soon wake up in an unknown valley and no one seems to be present. I guess you could say we are lost in a sea! <laughs> Simon's mom messages us to ask where are we and to get home. And that's your main task for the whole game. Find your way home. Simply enough. 
However, along this journey, you will encounter monstrous looking things in your journey towards home, and they will stop at nothing until you're dead. Why though? Just get some biscuits and tea and everything will just work itself out. The controls of the game are simple. You've got your usual PC shooter controls, WASD to move, hold down shift to run. However, this does consume stamina, so use it wisely. Left click to attack, R to reload guns, and click down the scroll on the mouse to aim, and E to interact with stuff. Sometimes items have a second feature to them by right clicking the item you are currently equipped with. For example, the knife switching to a stabbing motion. It does more damage, but at the cost of range. For light sources, it is to turn them on and off. In the case of guns, it is used as a shove feature to give you space to reload. You can press tab to access your menu, and as you can see, you only have six slots for the items. So a lot of time in the game, you'll be going through the menu to sort stuff out. Really, this should have been called menu of fear, you know what I'm saying? As you click each item on the menu, depending on what the item is, it gives you a variety of options to use. Use, equip, drop, combine, and dual wield. Yes, people, you heard me, dual wield. That's one of the unique things of Cryofear from any other Half-Life mod. Some items can be dual wielded with others, for example, your knife and phone. However, heavy items such as rifles or keys cannot be used for that. This actually helps a lot since it saves time on the menu and allows you to see through the dark and attack at the same time. However, if you are dual wielding with a pistol, they have to be equipped separately in order to reload it, which can sometimes end up in dire situations. Luckily, we have quick slots. Quick slots are those numbers down in the bottom, and you can assign items to that number by pressing them on your keyboard, and Simon will automatically equip it. It giving you the chance to reload or pull out another weapon to help. As course, with every survival horror, you have plenty of puzzles and keys to progress through your way of the game. Luckily, we have a notepad next to us on the menu, so any pages we find or codes we find, we can see them written on the notebook. Or just by interacting with the opted again, it will tell us what to do. You can view your current objective by pressing the B button. You also have your health boosts in the form of syringes. Oh my! Which can be easily missed and difficult to find, so use them wisely. I only recommend doing it if you're in a really bad condition, like about when 10% of your health is remaining. Luckily, they restore most of your health as Simon injects it into his arm, revealing his self-harmed wound. Oh, poor Simon. Speaking of exploration, that is important in Cry of Fear. Items are scattered around the place, so make sure you search for every nook and cranny in this game because you're going to need the ammo and the health. The world of Cry of Fear is terrifying and interesting at the same time, with monsters oozing from each corner, and the characters are interesting, like Simon's depression and loneliness. Speaking of sad things, listen to this music. The long, slow playing music accomplishes the game's theme of sadness and depression, regret, sorrow, and loneliness, which hits me deep. You could say it's similar to The Last of Us themes. The music in Cry of Fear is absolutely great, probably one of the greatest soundtracks I have ever heard. They can easily change the atmosphere to a sad tone, a calm tone, a mysterious tone, or a hellish tone. This music, accompanied with this scene, makes it even more terrifying, especially with these monsters coming from the dark. It's absolutely terrifying, and, it's, and it definitely succeeds on the horror aspect of the game. However, I will say that the dialogue can be a bit off and kind of ruining a few moments. Not all of them, of course, but just a few bits, like this one. But what? Out here? No, away from everything. 
Away from all this. Anyhow, as you play this game, you will notice a few Easter eggs. Some of them are jokey, and some of them are interesting. Take example this scene. Also a bit of a spoiler alert, but meh, whatever. It looks like that scene in Silent Hill 2, where James is on a boat heading towards the hotel. In fact, I think Silent Hill 2 had a massive influence on Cry of Fear. The rusted walls in the nightmare sections, using creepy noises to spook the player, use humanoid monsters as enemies, and the general themes of dark subjects. Now you may think to yourself, I'm in total love with this game, and I should marry it. Whilst you're 90% right, the game does have its flaws. Not every game is perfect. You may come across some glitches in the game, like an area not fully rendering, or opening a door even though you're in a different room. I would say its biggest problem is parkouring. Look, Simon, I know you're wearing a white hoodie, but that doesn't mean you're Altair Ibn Lahad, does it? Ha, and you thought I was going to say Etsy or Adatori. But yeah, there are parts of the game where you are going to struggle parkouring in this game, since the Gold Source engine does not really specialise in it. So sometimes you might fall off an edge or somehow not reach the platform. You have to do a classic crotch jump to get to the platform. And I know what you're saying, like I'm not a PC professionalist and I'm a console peasant. Despite that, you only come across it a few times, the parkouring stuff, leaving the rest of the game to enjoy, so it's good in that department. As you may have also noticed in this review, is the subtle hints about dark subjects. Cry Fear does not shy from dark subjects, such as self-harm, suicide, depression, anxiety, loneliness, and so forth. To me, this hits deep. Every time I play this game, I can see myself as Simon, or I can understand what Simon is going through. You see, I have autism, and communication is quite difficult for me, as well as learning, and I was quite often bullied by other kids in primary and secondary, and I didn't know why. It was because of this I was afraid of each day at school, and just hoped I didn't get bullied. Luckily, I did move to a different secondary school where I met just Jordan, but I still have moments where I just feel sad for some unknown reason. The bullying has just left a scar, and... I've had too many things in life that makes me anxious. Sometimes things overwhelm me and I just shut myself in my room playing video games to escape my worries. Even now as I record this, my fear will whisper to me saying, what if no one loves you? What if you get left behind? What if the person you love betrays you? When I do have those unexplained sad moments, I think of myself as Simon, walking down a dark empty street where it's cold and freezing. No one is here. No one is there to tell me that everything will be okay. It's exactly what, like what the first chapter says. I'm lost in a city. Each day we fight our demons and monsters that try and kill us, but we have to fight back, otherwise our lives will be a living hell. Even if they are nothing but torture, we have to keep fighting. As you may know, Cry of Fear has four endings. Three of them end like this. The fourth ending, though, leaves Simon alive, but leads to a police officer's death. This is the questionable good ending to the game. Now, originally, I thought the endings depended on the difficulty, or like how many syringes you take, similar to like, you know, Silent Hill's way of achieving endings. However, it turns out there are two specific events in the game that decide the outcome of the game. The first one is your boss fight with Carcass. You can escape the boss battle, or you can stay and fight it. The second one is your meeting with a site with the psycho doctor, where he asks you to get a gun for him, and he will give you a key. You can find the gun in the bowling alley, and when you return to the doctor, you have a choice. To get the good ending, you have to kill Carcass and give the gun to the doctor. Any other choices lead to this. <laughs> However, if you succeed in like doing the good part in order to get the good ending, you have one final challenge to face. Sick Simon. Simon's inner fear, or everything that he hates about him, I suppose. But I will say this now. These wheelchair controls, oh my 
Oh, that could be frustrating! The way he controls is more directional movement. You see, whatever Simon's legs are facing is the direction you will be going. You can use the A and B keys to set yourself in the right direction. You get used to it, but eventually, after dying many times... So in conclusion, this is definitely one of the best PC horror games I have played in a while. The atmosphere, the music, the gameplay, the relation the game has with me, pretty much everything is so enjoyable and definitely worth a replay to get a different ending. Obviously there was a whole lore to this game, like the monsters and how they relate to Simon, but it would take too long to do. Instead, I have put two links below um, to two different videos, explaining Simon's character and explaining the whole story itself as well. Heck, why not get the game now? It's free on Steam, and it's definitely worth getting, especially with all the unlockable content and its custom campaigns. Anyhow, this video has gone long enough as it is already. I'd like, you, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed watching it, why don't you like, comment, favor, and subscribe to see more content like this. And this is my conclusion. This is my end. Farewell, everyone.